Back in June, uh, Pastor Monteith had asked me to, to preach on a Wednesday night, and uh, we were in Colossians chapter 1. And I'd like for you to return uh, there in your Bibles, if you would, tonight, and uh, we'll uh, start to say we'll pick up where we left off. I don't know that I'll do that or not, but I do have a few more things I'd like to share with you from Colossians that uh, relate to uh, what uh, preached uh, back then. So Colossians chapter 1, uh, in your Bibles, if you would. And again, I'd like to express uh, my gratitude to Brother Monteith for the opportunity to uh, preach, and certainly am grateful for that. And, and uh, of course, I know you're praying for their safe return uh, tomorrow as well, and as well as the Lord will give them a good uh, relaxing time away. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth." Let's bow for prayer, please. Father, we are thankful for your word. Thank you for the fact that you have uh, revealed yourself and your truth uh, in the word of God. We thank you for the fact that uh, you have been pleased to uh, preserve your word for us. And I pray that as we spend a little time in it tonight that you would use that word. May the Holy Spirit use the word of God to speak to our hearts. We pray that it would fall into good ground and bring forth fruit in our lives that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified and magnified in us. We thank you for the salvation that you've given us in him. Thank you for the price that was paid uh, for our redemption and the forgiveness of our sin. And I pray that you'd help us to love Christ as we should. May we be yielded to him. And Father, we pray that you would help us day by day uh, to walk in fellowship and communion with him. And may we be submissive to you in all that we do. And Lord, we need you tonight. We certainly are not sufficient in ourselves and uh, we pray that uh, you'd help me to be empty of self and filled and controlled by the Spirit of God and again Lord we pray that you would bless and may Christ uh, be magnified in his name and for his sake we do pray amen uh, back in June we looked at verse 6 where Paul writing to this church at Colossae and uh, talking about the gospel of Christ. He says in verse 6, Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. And we were thinking about the fruit of the gospel of Christ. And if you'll read uh, through the book of Colossians, you'll see that there are uh, at least two ways that uh, this fruit is, uh, is to be manifest and revealed in our lives. Actually, one way it, it is uh, because it refers to our position that we have in Christ. Part of the fruit of the gospel uh, is expressed in what God has done for us or uh, in what we read that we have in Christ. Uh, an example of that, and I'm not going to spend time uh, re-preaching all of that from back then, but uh, 
An example of what I'm talking about is in verse 13. He says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now that's talking about what God has done. Not what God thought about doing. Not what God tried to do and failed. God has done this. And so if you're saved, then it is a biblical truth and it is part of your position in Christ that you have been delivered from the power of darkness. That's a fact. Uh, God has done that. Not only that, but uh, you have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And uh, again, that's what God has already done. Look at verse 13, or verse 14. Here's another one of those things. In whom we have. That's a, that's a possessive word, isn't it? We have redemption through his blood. Uh, again, that's a possession. God has done that. God has given that to us. And then he says this, even the forgiveness of sin. Uh, if you are saved, you are forgiven. Not, not of part of your sin, but of all of it. Uh, you know, he, he, he has not forgiven us our sin in part. As uh, the songwriter said, not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. That is a uh, possession that we have because of our position in Christ. Um, look down at verse 20. Here's another one of those things. He says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Uh, God's done that. Uh, he's accomplished that. And that is a present possession that we have as a result of that. That's our position in Christ. And there are several things uh, in the book of Colossians and in other books in the New Testament as well that uh, reveal to us uh, what is involved in our being in Christ. And the wonderful thing about that is that will never change. That is a permanent, but it's an eternal position, an, e, an eternal possession that we have, not because we've worked our way into salvation, not because somehow or another we have merited in God's sight uh, salvation, but because of His grace and His undeserved love, uh, which... Uh, uh, prompted him to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to this world to die for the sin of every man. And so part of the fruit of the gospel consists in what God has done for us, period. And uh, what a, that, that's a blessing. If you've never thought much about that, I'd, I'd encourage you. Uh, read and study your Bible and, and uh, just, just make a few notes of what you have in Christ. And if God says you have it, then that is an eternal possession. Tonight I want us to uh, think about another aspect of that. And I think, if I remember right, I, I might have just barely mentioned this uh, back in June, but there's the practical aspect of this as well. And whereas uh, our uh, positional fruit is identified by what God has done for us or what it says God has given us, there's at least two ways that uh, we find in the book of Colossians that we can identify a fruit that would be considered uh, practical in our daily living. One is uh, by... Uh, Paul's prayer request, what he said, not the request, but the statements that Paul makes relative to what he is praying for the Colossians. The other way is uh, verses that have to do with uh, challenging us the way we live. That, that would be practical fruit of the gospel. Uh, for example, look over to chapter 3 and uh, look at verse 5. 
He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify, he said. Put those things to death. Don't let those things be a part of your life. That, see, you have a part in that, don't you? Uh, I mean, we have a part in our salvation as well as far as believing what God has said. Uh, but here, in practical Christian living, uh, it's required that we submit ourselves to God. When God says, mortify therefore your members uh, which are upon the earth, that's what we're supposed to do. Look down, if you would, at verse, uh, uh, verse 8. He says, but now you also put off all these. And then he names several things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, and so forth. So, practically speaking, in chapter 3, uh, there are things we're supposed to put off and things that we're supposed to put on. That is practical Christian living. And that really is an ongoing work. And that is part of the fruit of the gospel of Christ that has not yet been fully realized in any of our lives. I was thinking earlier this afternoon, and I was, uh, as I was thinking, going over my, my notes and everything, is there any area in our lives, and not I'll ask you to show hands or anything like that, but have you reached any area in your Christian living where you don't need to grow anymore? Where, where you don't need improvement? Where, where you don't need uh, God's help um, you know, further on in your uh, Christian living? I, I don't know about you, but I can't think of a, a thing in which I could say, Dale Coffey has reached the pinnacle he has, he has progressed spiritually in this area to the point that he no longer needs any more growth in that. Well, I'd be a liar and a hypocrite if I made that type of claim. So this, that this is an ongoing work. It's what we would refer to as progressive sanctification. Now, a lot of times when you hear that word progressive, when it's used in a political uh, context that uh, that ought to get our concern. Uh, that's usually not a good thing. But progressive sanctification is certainly a good thing from the Bible because it's talking about progress in becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ, becoming uh, more yielded to Him, and it is an unfinished work. God began that when we got saved. And God continues that until we're at home uh, in heaven with Him. And so <clears throat> this, uh, this matter of, our, of the fruit of the gospel relative to our position in Christ, uh, that's, uh, that's been accomplished. And really God can't improve on that. God really doesn't add to that. Now there are certain aspects of that that uh, has not yet been fully realized. For example, uh, our glorification. That's still future, isn't it? But it's a done deal. It's just as certain as uh, our salvation to begin with. The fact that uh, we, matter of fact, Romans 8, I think we did look at that <clears throat> the last time uh, we were looking at this. Uh, those words there in Romans 8 tells us whom God justified them, he also glorified. And so God's, in God's mind, that's already done. And so in that sense, uh, that's not yet been, uh, been fully realized. Uh, these other aspects of our positional blessings in Christ, uh, they, they have been. And... Uh, whereas that, that uh, salvation provides that foundation for assurance. The, fa the fact that God has 
done these things that Colossians 1 and other places tells us he has done, uh, that enables us to have the assurance that our sin is forgiven because God has accomplished that. But when you're thinking about sanctification, uh, that would have more to do with uh, at least one of the motivations that we should have for our daily living. None of us ought to be content with just being saved. Our desire should be that we please God. And when we uh, please God in our daily living, and when we stand before Him, we would hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul wrote about that. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 9, he says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And he's not talking there about uh, accepted into heaven, uh, having to do with eternal life and whether we're going to go to heaven or hell. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ and the possibility of our lives being approved of God since we've been saved. And so, uh, in uh, the book of Colossians, we, uh, we have this fruit of the gospel that is to be manifested in your life and in mine by the way we live day by day. Look at verse 9, if you would. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 9 <clears throat> would indicate uh, that these, these things uh, have not been fully realized in our lives yet. He says you, that he desires that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, that would certainly indicate that there's a good possibility that, 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 uh, that that's still a need in our lives, isn't it? Same thing in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and do all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so part of this fruit of the gospel of Christ that's to be found in our lives after we're saved, we learn is uh, th this uh, uh, matter of increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's something that we're never going to uh, fully uh, realize. We're, we're, we're never going to reach the point to where we know all there is to know about God. God's infinite in every, every aspect. He's infinite in His power, infinite in His holiness, infinite in His wisdom, His grace. Everything about God uh, cannot be, be put uh, into a measure, and therefore our knowledge and our understanding of Him uh, will never be fully accomplished. We'll never get to the place in our lives to where we don't need to increase in our knowledge of Him. We're to continually be growing and increasing in that knowledge. Now, uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what, what does verse 9 show us uh, about uh, th this practical fruit again? He says that you, uh, his desire was that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So one thing that uh, we know is that, uh, uh, that part of the fruit of the gospel, part of what the gospel of Christ is to be doing, working in your life and mine, is that uh, we're to be filled with the knowledge of his will. So knowledge, that's, that's uh, uh, God's, God's desire. Uh, that, that's part of that fruit. Uh, 
that we're to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10 says, increasing in the knowledge of God. I thought about Habakkuk again, and I'm not going to go back and, and uh, preach that again, but uh, <clears throat> one thing that I didn't mention this morning is uh, what I believe one of the reasons why Habakkuk got to the point to where he was able to make those statements in chapter 3, uh, verses 17 through 19, describing that uh, destitute scene of where there's nothing out there. And he says, yet I will joy uh, in God. Uh, the Lord is my strength. What, in, what, what, what helped him to do that? Well, if you go back and you'll read uh, the previous verses in that chapter, uh, you'll see that he focused on, on God's, uh, God's person. He talks about who God is. He talks about God's power. And then he talks about the, the fact that God has unfailing care for his people. And that was in light of the pending Babylonian invasion. And by the way, <clears throat> Habakkuk had uh, some problems as well. And, and we know that uh, he experienced an increase in, him, in his knowledge of God just in those three chapters that we have recorded for us because in chapter 1, uh, he's asking God, Lord, why don't you judge this people? He looked all around him and he saw wickedness. He saw uh, sin. He, he saw uh, carnality and hypocrisy. Uh, he saw lack of judgment. And so his thought was, Lord, you need to judge his people. Uh, <clears throat> God uh, spoke to him and uh, helped him with that. God told him, basically, Habakkuk, I'm, I'm going to take care of this. And uh, he told him that he was going to bring the Babylonians, the Chaldeans in there. Well, Habakkuk wondered why he was going to do that. Why, why use a nation, why use a people in Habakkuk's eyes that's worse than we are to judge us? And so Habakkuk was asking why. And God uh, dealt, uh, dealt with that too. And when you come to chapter 3, Habakkuk has grown in his knowledge of God. He's increased in his understanding of God to the point that he was able to say, uh, in spite of what goes on all around me, I'm going to rejoice in my God. That's one reason why we need to be growing in our knowledge of him. Now, a good question for us to think about is what, what if we don't do that? What are, are there consequences of a Christian not growing in their knowledge of God and of his will? And I think the answer to that's clear. We uh, look to the Old Testament again and we see a prime example of that in Israel. Uh, what happens when people don't grow in their knowledge and understanding of God? Look at Israel. We read about it, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Here's what God said about them. Therefore, my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge. Doesn't mean they didn't have knowledge to how to build buildings or do things like that, how to raise crops and that type of thing. He's talking about their knowledge of him. And uh, that wasn't important to them. In Hosea 4 and verse 6, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then he goes on and says this, because thou hast rejected knowledge. You see, that shows us that it was not a matter of the knowledge not being available. Well, it wasn't a matter of God hiding himself and not desiring to reveal himself to his people. Their problem was that God had revealed himself and they rejected it. And they suffered for that. He says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. 
that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And so there's a price to pay, really. There, there are consequences. If we do not uh, allow the fruit of the gospel of Christ to produce in us a growing, increasing knowledge of God, and in other passages in the New Testament, we see how Paul stressed the importance of that. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 5, he says that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 4 verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we... Henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Then Philippians 1, 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And so throughout the New Testament we see that emphasized. And Peter, uh, this is probably one of the uh, most uh, widely recognized verses where Peter says in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And I want to make sure to point out that that knowledge is centered in Christ. How do we get to know God better? By knowing Christ better. By learning of Him. Colossians 3 and verse 10, uh, we read that earlier, I believe it says, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. Colossians 2 and verse 3, in whom, Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Philippians 3, 10, that I may know Him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. So it's all in Christ. And uh, this knowledge of Christ in which we are to be growing and increasing, uh, that produces the very opposite of that that was a real problem at Colossae. Uh, when we looked at this earlier, we mentioned the Gnostics, and that was a group that had infiltrated the church at uh, Colossae, and they were heretics. They taught false, that they believed error. They had an emphasis on knowledge, but it wasn't the knowledge of God. It wasn't knowledge that it was based on truth. Matter of fact, if you look at chapter 2, Verse 8, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And that's exactly what part of the problem was at Colossae. They were uh, people there that were puffed up. They were impressed with themselves and they thought that they had more knowledge. They thought that they had some type of secret uh, revelation of God that the average person didn't have. And part of what they believed was that all matter was evil. Everything physical was evil. And that would mean that the Lord Jesus... They denied the deity of the Lord Jesus because he literally came in the flesh, didn't he? Notice how Paul deals with that. Verse 9, he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so these Gnostics, they were wrong. But boy, they were proud and 
and they were puffed up and they thought they were better. They, they were superior in their knowledge than everybody else. Well, this knowledge that we're talking about growing in that uh, God desires for us is not going to result in that. Look over in chapter 3 and verse 9. He says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, and then notice what he says, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. You know, one of the evidences, one of the uh, characteristics of a growing knowledge of Christ in the Christian's life is genuine and sincere humility. You know, uh, that's just the opposite of the world, isn't it? And a lot of times you, you, you think about unsaved people and uh, maybe even carnal Christians. They might uh, have a lot of knowledge about certain things and isn't it common that that results in a lot of pride, a lot of uh, self. Not so with growing in the knowledge of Christ. The fruit of that is going to be what he says here in verse 12, humbleness of mind. That's God's desire for each one of us. That's what God desires to produce in all of his people. And that comes uh, through an increasing knowledge of Christ. And as we increase in our knowledge of Christ, then obviously we're learning more about God. Isaiah would be one of the best examples in the Old Testament of that truth. In chapter 6, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He describes the seraphim, and they were crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You think Isaiah, after he had that vision of God, might have gone out to uh, his fellow prophets and said, boy, you should have been with me. I mean, if you'd have been where you should have been, if you'd have been with me, my, my what, uh, what, what, what took place? I saw God. You didn't. I, God revealed himself to me like he hasn't revealed himself to you. That didn't happen at all, did it? Isaiah said, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone, he says. And so, this, uh, th this growth, this progression uh, in knowledge of God uh, produces a genuine humility before God and before men in our lives. Now, how how's that accomplished in us? What, uh, what, what do we need to do and remember in that regard? Well, one is that has to be uh, our desire. John 7, verse 17, Jesus said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether I whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. You've got to have a desire. And, you know, good, good to examine our hearts and uh, question ourselves sometimes and, and say, now, do I? Is my desire, has my desire to know God uh, growing or is it diminished? Uh, thinking back on, on uh, my life, uh, I'm not talking about mine personally, but all of ours, uh, when, when you think about uh, previous years since you've been saved, 
Was there a greater desire to know God in a greater way perhaps then than, than there is now? That, uh, that desire has to be there. Uh, and, and I believe God will honor that desire. Psalm 143 and verse 10 says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Do we have a desire to be taught? It's interesting over in chapter 4 in Colossians, we see how that uh, <clears throat> uh, Epaphras, Paul's fellow laborer, had that desire for these people at Colossae. It says in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's a noble desire. He, he desired that not only for himself, but for the others as well. And that's a commendable uh, characteristic of all or should be for all of us, then it's going to require dedication and devotion if we're going to grow and progress in our knowledge of God that that fruit of the gospel might be manifest in us. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. And knowing and, and understanding the will of God, we need to remember... Uh, will be in contrast and in opposition oftentimes to the world. Familiar verses to that effect would be Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that would be the equivalent of growing in our knowledge of God, wouldn't it? The renewing of our minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And so uh, I need to understand if I'm to grow in my knowledge of God that I need, that's one of the things I need to put off in my life is the darkness of this world and the vain philosophy of this world. Then, of course, we grow in our knowledge of God uh, through the scriptures. And there's no substitute for that. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, Paul reminds Timothy that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And if I want to grow in my knowledge and understanding of God and His will, then I need to make sure that I'm spending time in God's Word, which the we just read there in verse 16. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, you ever have things in your life that are not right? That's when you need reproof, isn't it? Who better to reprove us than God? God does that through His Word. Instru correction. Instruction in righteousness. All of the Bible helps us understand and grow in our knowledge of Christ. And then, of course, we cannot ignore the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in our growing in knowledge. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things 
that are freely given us to God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And then listen to what, what it says in the latter part of that verse. But we have the mind of Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thing what the Lord has done for us when he saved us? Not only forgave our sin and gave us uh, the assurance of a home in heaven, but in regard to our earthly journey, this pilgrimage that we're on through this unbelieving world of darkness, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And if I need wisdom and, and a direction and, and how to navigate through this perilous world, God provided that. God's given us His Word and He has uh, given us uh, His Spirit uh, to guide us in that journey. And I've got to come to a close here. I, I, I need to uh, leave some things out here. Look back in chapter 1 if you would. <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. What, uh, what do I want to omit uh, <clears throat> verse 9 again for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Verse 11 gives us three things that, again, are part of this fruit of the gospel that God desires to produce in us. One is his strength. I'm just going to have to mention this. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Uh, <clears throat> those words strengthened and power uh, really come from the same root word from which we get our word dynamite. And that's the word that's used in uh, Romans 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The power of God that saves us is also the power of God that strengthens us in our earthly journey, in our earthly lives. And along with that, or, or part of that I should say, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering, He said. Those things are very similar, patience and long-suffering. Patience is uh, understood basically as endurance, and the word we probably use more than anything is faithfulness. Being faithful in the midst of trial, going through difficulties. You, you're patient. You, it, it doesn't mean that you just grit your teeth and fold your hands and grin and bear it. But it means that you endure as a good soldier of Jesus Christ hardness. Then he says, you do you know, the same with long-suffering. And that basically is referring to patience with people. I'm sure we don't have any problems with that, do we? Uh, you know, let, <clears throat> let the trials come. We can deal with that, but boy, when it's people, uh, that can be a different story sometimes, can't it? 
One, uh, one writer described it like this, and I like the way he put it. He says, the difference between patience and long-suffering has been defined as the difference between enduring without complaint and enduring without retaliation. And there is a difference in that, isn't there? Enduring without retaliation. When I'm going through a trial and difficulty or when you're going through that as a Christian and if I'm manifesting Christ and if I'm allowing this fruit of the gospel to be uh, revealed in me, then I'm not going to be taking that out on my wife or my husband. Or your, you wives don't be taking it out on your husband. I ought to be careful the way I say that. You're not going to take it out on your children. Long-suffering has to do with... Uh, patiently uh, dealing with uh, uh, people that trouble you. That's part of the fruit of the gospel. How, how are we doing in that area, in our Christian lives, in that, in that practical uh, aspect of Christian living? How do we measure up? But then, look at that next thing. This, this, this is really the one that gets me, I think, more than any of it as far as verse 11 goes, he says, you do it with joyfulness. Mm, that's right, isn't it? Joyfulness. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Now, do you have it in yourself, in your own power, is that inherently in you to be able to do that? No. But we, we need to remember this. One of the things that God did when he saved us and when we heard the gospel and uh, we, we trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit of God uh, took up his abode in us. And joy is uh, the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. We don't have it in ourselves to do that, do we? We're to manifest this fruit <clears throat> of the gospel of Christ uh, as we're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness and there's more than one example in the Bible of people of God who did that very thing and if it was available to them then it's certainly available to us and God has provided uh, all that we need uh, to live a life in which uh, the fruit of the gospel is manifested through our daily Christian living, but that's going to require that we grow in our knowledge of Him. And that's going to require that we have a desire to do that and that we're dedicated and devoted uh, to that. Let's bow for prayer. I need to go ahead and stop. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us in the Lord Jesus. And we're glad that uh, we are saved from an eternal hell. And we're certainly grateful that all of our sin has been forgiven. And we do rejoice in these uh, truths uh, relative to the gospel of Christ that you have done for us. These things, Lord, are certain. and They're fixed. We're grateful for that. And I pray as well that when we consider the practical aspect of the gospel of Christ and its power in our lives, Lord, help us to realize that your plan and your purpose for us is that we continually are making progress and going forward 
and this fruit of the gospel uh, being manifest in us. Pray that you'd help us daily to spend time with you, spend time in your word. Lord, help us daily to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. And may he have the liberty in our lives to mold us, fashion us, to be more Christ-like uh, day by day. In Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. Let's stand, if you would, please, with our heads bowed, eyes closed. And again, I need to remember that if you desire fruit of the gospel in your life, then you first of all need to make sure that uh, the power of the gospel of Christ has been manifest in salvation. Knowing Christ as your Savior. Everything else would be in vain to attempt these uh, uh, characteristics or to try to produce these fruits if the root of Christ is not there. And as Christians... Our desire daily should be that we grow in our knowledge of Him and in our conformity to Him.